Hi guys, so you may be wondering, what the heck is this thing? Is it a, a Mauser? Is it a Berthier? Um, half the internet watching this probably thinks it's some kind of a Mosin, because of course they do. Well, I'll tell you what, this is what you get when a Turkish guy steals a French guy's stuff and makes it his own. This is an Armand Berthier carbine, otherwise known as a Turkish forestry carbine. And the first time I saw one of these things was actually on a video done by Forgotten Weapons. Um, that video kind of piqued my interest in it, and a few years after watching it, I was able to find one for sale and I bought it. Um, but what really interested me in this wasn't the fact that it was a Berthier, because I'm not that enthused with French weapons, but um, the history behind it. Like, for instance, how, what are the Turks doing with a bunch of old French rifles from World War I? And um, how, how did they get them? Why did they do what they did? For what purpose? And in the video, uh, Mr. McCollum talks about how they were issued to the Forestry Service and generally why, and gives a very good explanation. But the thing that left me curious was his explanation for how these rifles got into Turkey. Um, he said that they probably intercepted some Vichy French weapons shipments during World War II, but he doesn't really give a lot of details, and he sounds kind of unsure, like maybe they might have come from somewhere else. And so I decided that I would do my own video on this. And so I went researching around on the internet, and I think I found what is the most likely answer to the story, along with a lot of unlikely or incomplete stories. But we'll get into that in a little bit. First, I'll go ahead and give you guys a closer look at this. We'll talk about the basic rifle, you know. Um, and then I will go into my, the results of my research. Okay, so basic features of the rifle. Bolt-action rifle. It feeds from a three-round end block clip. Yeah, you heard that right. Three rounds. Um, there's a long explanation for it, but basically for most World War I when they were making these rifles, they had three-round end block clips. Um, I know, not very conventional, most people think of five, but at the time, it wasn't as conventional, I guess. Anyway, you got your in-block clip, you feed it into your magazine, you're firing, you're firing, you're firing, when you load the last round, this clip, minus rounds, will fall out the bottom through a hole in the floor plate, right? Um, basic conversion process, they cut them down to carbine length, they add on a Mauser front end here, and they bend the bolt handle. Now, this, some specific features of my rifle, this is a ball-end converted rifle, as most of these rifles are. Um, if you're not familiar with ball-end, it's a conversion to a post-World War I era cartridge. It was done roughly in the 30s. Um, basically what they did is they'd remount the chamber a little bit. This cartridge has a thicker case, and so the N is just a mark that it is safe to shoot ball N in this rifle because older rifles with the chambers uh, unmodified couldn't safely shoot the round. Uh, these rifles are marked IC Orman 1948. Orman is forest in Turkish, and 1948 is the year that they did these conversions. Um, my specific rifle was originally made in Chatel Row and is an M16 pattern rifle. Uh, also, I've got a sling on here. Uh, this sling is definitely old and it's definitely something you expect to see from like the 40s and 50s, whether it's a French sling or just the sling that the Turkish forest ranger put on it, I don't know, but it's definitely old and um, I'd have to break it to take it off. So uh, it's not coming off. Let's talk about why these rifles actually exist. Why does Turkey have a bunch of Berthiers converted, right? So in the late 40s, Turkey has several problems, even with World War II now ended. One of those problems was illegal logging. Um, specifically, 
uh, illegal logging of Circassian walnut, which was a valuable commodity at the time. This was apparently a large enough problem that they decided to do something about it. They had the Turkish Forestry Corps, which was a group of ranchers that would go out and try to catch these poachers, tree poachers, I should say. Um, and they were originally armed with revolvers. They decided they wanted a bit of a firepower upgrade. Apparently, some of these I illegal loggers, these tree poachers, were fighting back. So, in comes problem two. You think, okay, well, let's just give them a rifle, because that's way better than a revolver, right? The problem is, Turkey is also having problems with rebel groups at this time. And what these groups of rebels were doing was they would attack isolated police stations in order to capture arms, in order to fight the government. Well, if you start giving a bunch of really nice rifles to these forest rangers that are out isolated in the wilderness, these rebels are going to start hunting them f to take their guns so that they can fight the government. So you want to give the forest rangers something that's either not enticing enough for the rebels to bother, or if the rebels do get it, it's, it's not valuable to them. They can't really use it. Um, another problem that they have is the Turkish forest rangers did most of their work on foot through the rugged terrain of Turkey. So they needed something rugged and reliable and effective enough to justify carrying the weight around out in the woods, right? Luckily, the French had, or I'm sorry, not the French, the Turks, the Turks had a bunch of these French berthiers lying around. Um, now, the great thing about this is, you remember I mentioned the three-shot capacity, which is, I'm assuming, the determining factor for using these. They're uh, not effective enough to warrant attention from the rebels, but they're a big step up from revolvers, right? That, and if you make them any of these nice little carbines, they're kind of handy and the weight is justifiable. Uh, another issue that I understand is that the 8mm Lebel cartridge that this fires wasn't easy for civilians to get in Turkey. However, the government was able to acquire it. So if you know, a rebel did happen upon a uh, forest ranger, kill him and take his rifle, it, it wasn't of that much use because there was a limited supply of ammunition for him to utilize. We've done the why. Why do the Turks have these rifles? Let's get into the how. How does the Turkish government manage to get its hands on a bunch of French berthiers? There are several theories. I'll go through the different theories that I've seen and then we'll get to the final one that I think is the most accurate. Uh, each of these theories has, you know, a little bit of truth to them, but it's just not the full picture. So we'll go through, and we'll begin with the one that I think is the best out of them, and that is, one, the Forgotten Weapons video. Mr. McCollum, in his video, mentions that during World War II, there were some fishy French arms shipments, and that Turkey was able to capture them. I'll get into why... I was kind of suspect of this theory later on, but suffice it to say, it just didn't make sense to me, looking at, you know, the geography and the, the infrastructure, that the Turks would be able to acquire these rifles, given where they were going. Okay, so theory two, and this theory I found in the comments of the Forgotten Weapons video. So in the comments of the Forgotten Weapons video, I saw several Turkish people claiming that these rifles were actually captured during the First World War, or that they were captured in the chaos following the First World War, where Turkey was kind of carving itself out as an independent nation. You know, you had the Greeks and the French and the British all running around. Um, the problem with this theory, because at, at first on surface I was like, yeah, that makes sense. They would have captured a lot of rifles, and we know that Turkey at the time was kind of strapped for rifles, so why wouldn't they use them? Here's the problem. Most of the rifles that we find have the ball end conversion. And like I said, this ball end conversion was done between the two world wars, roughly in the 30s. So if they were captured before then, why do they have the ball end conversion? Well, theory number three. This one I found in an article online, and it's interesting, and I bet there's some things that they get right, but this is kind of one of the, one of the worst theories. Um, out of the bunch, but it's interesting, so I'll go through it. So this guy claimed that all, and I mean all of the rifles that Turkey captured and then converted 
were from Vichy French troops in Syria retreating into Turkey to avoid capture by the Allies when they invaded Turkey during World War II. Sorry, when they invaded Syria during World War II. Now initially, like, you think of the history and it's like, okay, that makes sense. You know, Syria is right on the southern border of Turkey. Um, the British are already involved, already involved in Iraq. They can't evacuate by sea. How are, the, how are they going to avoid capture? Um, th this starts to fall apart when you realize that for Turkey to have the number of rifles that they did, that would mean that roughly a quarter of the Vichy French force would have to be able to escape with their equipment across the border. That's a lot of guys. Um, it, it just doesn't seem that likely. And from what I understand about the history of the time period, there weren't that many Vichy French troops unaccounted for after, you know, the British pushed them the British, the French, the Free French, uh, pushed them out. Uh, I also want to note that in this theory, the author mentions a reason for choosing this rifle um, over other rifles to arm the forest rangers, and it's it's fairly ludicrous, <laughs> um, so I'll go ahead and mention it. He claimed they chose these rifles because of the unique wounds that the 8mm label would cause, and so after a forest ranger shot a tree poacher, if that poacher got away and survived and went to seek medical treatment, the doctors would recognize this unique wound and then, you know, they would know that, oh, well, this guy got shot by a forest ranger, so he was obviously, you know, illegally logging, and so we should arrest him. It was a way to, you know, confirm the guilt of a tree poacher if they sought medical treatment or something like that. Um, <laughs> obviously, that's pretty ridiculous. Uh, as far as I know, 8mm label doesn't cause such a unique wound that it would be recognizable from any other rifle wound. Fourth, and now final theory. This is the one that I found that I think makes the most sense and gives us more of the whole picture. Um, so, these rifles came from several sources. One of the first sources was being captured during World War I and the interwar chaos by the Turks. Um, there were some French forces at Gallipoli during the, I should say, during the Gallipoli campaign. And then after the war, there were French and then Greek forces who were also using these kinds of rifles, um, occupying Turkey. Uh, and the, Tur the Turks didn't really like this occupation, so they kind of fought against them. And some of these rifles could have been captured there. Um, and then you get into the, uh, the interwar years, like I said, and apparently the Turks purchased some of these rifles for some reason. Um, the source that I had didn't really explain why, but they did. Um, and then you get into World War II, and this is where, uh, Mr. McCollum's theory comes into play, and he talks about them capturing fishy French weapon shipments. This actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, I was initially skeptical because of the uh, the way that they would have been transported, but after looking into it, I thought, no, I guess that does make sense. So, Vichy France supported the uprising in Iraq against the British. Now, the, the Germans uh, and Italians would send aircraft to help them out. The Vichy French sent rifles, these rifles, or at least they would have. Um, for whatever reason, they sent them exclusively using the Hejaz and then Berlin-Baghdad railway. So, they went north, across the border through Turkey, and then s turned south into Iraq. Why they use this exclusively, I have no idea, because looking on a map, looking at a map of the area at the time, they could have used a combination of roads and uh, the Euphrates River. Or, yeah, yeah, the Euphrates River to ship these rifles into Iraq. No idea why they didn't do that instead, because it would have completely kept it out of Turkish land, but they exclusively used the railroad system, and the railroad system, like I said, it runs through the southern border of Turkey, and so when they ship these rifles using the railway, the, the Turkish uh, border guards, um, or custom agents or whoever it was, stopped them, and 
seize the weapons. Um, they probably did this, one, because, hey, look, rifles, we could use those, the world's kind of gone to hell. And they were also kind of juggling their, uh, their diplomacy between the Axis and the Allies, and if it was known to the Allies that a bunch of rifles went through Turkey and then made it to Iraq to shoot at Allied soldiers, that wouldn't look well for them. Um, and, uh, of course, then you say, well... Doesn't, wouldn't that mean that the Germans and Vichy French and the Axis would be mad at them for seizing their rifles? I don't know. Apparently it was worth it to seize them and not let them go through. Uh, but yeah, the, that's why I was skeptical. I was like, well, why wouldn't they just do it in a way that wouldn't let the Turks capture them? For whatever reason, they didn't do it. Maybe it would have taken too long, or maybe they had an agreement with Turkey that Turkey then broke. But... Um, yeah, they use the railroad exclusively, and that's why the Turks were able to capture weapon shipments. Um, aside from that, apparently Germany also sent some shipments of these rifles as kind of a bribe to Turkey, uh, either to keep them out of the war or to try and, you know, get some political points in order to get them to join the war on the Axis side. Uh, so that's how these rifles got into Turkey. Uh, a combination of these uh, various events. So, after acquiring these rifles via various means, the Turks end up with tens of thousands of them in inventory. From this inventory, they would select the rifles to be converted. This conversion is thought to have taken place at Ankara, and anywhere between three to 10,000 rifles are said to have been converted, although the most common number is 8,000. They would select the rifles um, based off their overall condition. Things like, is the bore still good? Uh, is the action still uh, strong? Is there still, um, is there still finish left on the receiver? Things like that. Now, after these conversions were done, they would be issued to the Forestry Corps, where they would see a lot of service, apparently only being retired in the 1980s. So that's a significant service life for converted World War I era rifles. Now, most of these rifles were the 1915 pattern. However, some of them were the M16 pattern, which is what I've got here. So that's the full story. Or is it? Well, it's what I believe is the most accurate and, you know, the, the most inclusive story, the, the full story. And as you can see, it kind of... It kind of ends up combining several of the other theories of how these rifles got to Turkey and why. The problem is, I don't have any first-hand accounts from Turkey. I don't have access to uh, Turkish archives. I don't even speak Turkish, so it wouldn't matter. So I had to go on the internet and do most of my research there. Um, so there could be something that I'm missing, or I could be completely missing the mark. All of us could. Maybe that one guy is right, and it's from troops retreating into Turkey from Syria. I don't know. But, um, like I said, this is the one that I think is the most accurate, and so that's why I included it in this video as the story. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the video. There will hopefully be another video further on in the future of me shooting the rifle and going over my personal thoughts on it. But, until then, like I said, I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time.